and program on Other Than Earth 24 is classified MA. It is intended for adults and may be unsuitable for children under 17. It may contain crude and decent language, explicit sexual activity, graphic violence, or political ideology. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. The following program contains opinions of the participants and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Veterna Media Network. The network believes in a safe space for all ideas to be expressed without any censorship and on its duty to create such a platform for free speech. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. Now showing on Colombo Liberal screens, the return of the Newland. It is said that, more often than not, a murderer would visit the site of a crime. Welcome to Sri Lanka, Miss Victoria Newland. Who is she? Well, her title says she is the US Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs. Translation, instill fear in countries worldwide to worship America. She first came to Sri Lanka on March 22, 2022 and had talks with former President Gotabe Rajapaksa. Soon after, he lived like a coward and failed to act as a leader. Later, he fled the country like a common criminal, shaming and fecal smearing the 6.9 million souls that trusted him while showcasing to the world that Sri Lankans are Neanderthals. But Mama Newland celebrated this undemocratic removal of an elected leader saying, and I quote, that the US is proud to be your partner as you do the hard work. And now she's back. With her, she brought buzzwords like reconciliation, good governance and climate change to make sense of what this visit would mean. And about other matters, I will speak to political analyst Malinda Senivratna and former chairman of the Strategic Enterprise Management Agency Ashok Abegunavardhana. Good evening, I'm Mahesh Joni and this is the State of the Nation. Hello everyone, good to see you. Thank you for spending your evenings with us. We have a packed show for you tonight as well, so let's get right to it. Well, yesterday Sri Lanka celebrated, well, uh, actually somberly remembered would be a better way of saying it, our independence from the British Empire. It has been 75 years since we lived on our own, governed by our own, and led by our own. And by the end of 75 years, by our own, we run our country to the ground. How much ever we try to whitewash it, that is the sad truth. But the good news is, now there's no way but up. So the president, while addressing the nation yesterday, was hopeful. Patwenu Dakima, Ape Apeksha Vaikiela. Venat Kisidu Peradiga Ratak Pilibanda, own Eveni Apeksha Vak Etikaragate Nehe. Et Vartamane, Apata Siduiate Kumakda. Adap Itiase Metak Novu, Viru Devanta Artika Arbu Dekata, Muna de Minine. Mat Itiase, Meveni Barapatala Tatwekata, Apa Muna Dila Ne. Apata Eveni Tatwek Udavuni Ai. May Tatweta Vagakian known a coder. Api at the Katagarmu. May Tatweta Apisilu denam, Adua divashain, Vagakiva yuti. Rate artike, dinen dinner, Kada vetenta patangata. Api desha pan the porundu, itukirima sandha, Satan part of a link kiu de, Sanata kirima sandha, Vadivadi ed, Nayagata. Api Vadivadi and Nayagate, Padiboja in the Missa Avijan de Noe. Namut Budun Vadale. Nayagati Ute, Avijan into Missa Padi Bojan, Novekil. Api Bauda Kamak and Kataka and Nagabang, Budun Vadala Dharma to Pitingia. Singapore, Godenagan Hati, Iganaganta, Lanka, Tapu, Liko, New, Audu Gananaka Pasu, Mena Mehemakino. Obe Ratata, Me Tatwe Atune, Anna Shelesa Deshapanta, Multana Demonisai. 
ඔබේ රට ආදර්ශයට ගත්තා නම් අද සිංගප්පු උරුවත් විනාශයි ඇත්තටම අපි දැන් විනාශය කර ඇවිත් තියෙන්නේ මා උත්සාහ ගන්නේ මතු පිටින් පෙනෙන රෝගී තත්ත්වයට වේදනා නාශක දෙන්ට නොවේ රෝග නිධානයට පිළියම් කිරීමටයි එය අසීරුයි දුෂ්කරයි නමුත් අප යා යුතු එකම මාර්ගයයි ජනාධිපති දුරයට පත් වූ දා පටන් මට ගන්ට සිදු වුණ තීන්දු බොහෝමයක් ජනප්‍රිය තීන්දු නොවන බව මම දන්නවා නමුත් ඒ තීන්දු නිසා අද මේ රටේ කිසිම පුරවැසියෙකු තෙල් පෝලිම් වල විජලනයෙන් මිය යන්නේ නැහැ ගෑස් නොමැතිව බඩගින්නේ ඉන්නේ නැහැ පොහොර නොමැතිව ශාප කරන්නේ නැහැ ඒ නිසා අරාජිකවාදී දේශපාලන බලවේගයන් කවර බාධක නිර්මාණය කළත් මම මේ රටට ආදරය කරන බහුතර ජනතාව සමග එක්වී මේ නව ප්‍රතිසංස්කරණ වැඩසටහන ඉදිරියට ගෙන යනවා සාමය සංහිදයව පෙරදැරි කරගෙන එකමුතුව සැලසුම් සහගත ඉදිරියට ගොත් අපට දෙදා සතලිස් අට වෙද්දී සංවර්ධිත රාජ්‍යයක් බවට පත් වෙන්න පුළුවන් ලෝකයේ වෙනත් කිසිදු රටක අතපාන්නේ නැති දියුණු රටක් බවට පත් වෙන්න පුළුවන් සැබෑ නිදහස උදා කර ගන්න පුළුවන් Now one of the key things that was mentioned uh, during the president's speech was the debt this nation has and that got me thinking who has the highest number of external debt in the world surely it must be a country from africa right like congo or gabon or surely a country from south america like venezuela or perhaps argentina because you know the imf had to go save argentina actually correction kill argentina or it could be us sri lanka after all every politician who is in the opposition especially dr harsha de silva loves to use this buzzwords chinese debt mahinda's debt rajapaksa debt so maybe it's us my curiosity got me to google search with country uh, which country has the highest number of external debt instead of telling who who it is let me just play the google search for you so you can see who has the highest external debt in the world drum roll please oh wait japan now this is according to data from the imf the colombo liberals trusted lending agency that puts countries back on track so according to the list by the imf that has calculated national external debt they say that japan has the highest debt to gdp in the world according to data online japan's debt is around 4.1 trillion dollars but hang on isn't japan a wealthy nation considered to be a wealthy country so how come they have so much debt also very curious to know very sri lanka wait right below the united states of america this does not make sense how come our external debt is just below the us according to uh, information uh, online uh, us debt was around 24 trillion in 2022 and ours is closer to 60 billion dollars yet the us is considered to be a very wealthy nation and sri lanka a bankrupt one well when you dive deep into this you will find how they changed the narrative to mislead you and give you a fake narrative that will break your spirit and keep us in the beggar state mentality all this nonsense we've heard from especially from the opposition party members and the dumbest level of intelligent group that exists in the universe the colombo liberals and their abysmal twitter lecturing is that when you have debt it's the worst thing but the truth is that every single country has debt the ones that are very successful have an exuberant amount of debt so when the story of having a high debt is bad is false as just like the promises made by a certain economic doctor from a colombo think tank we have to ask then this obvious question okay why do countries like japan the us the switzerland have such a large number of external debt and yet are successful but countries like sri lanka maldives and bhutan not then you will find that it's not about the debt it's about trade these successful countries have very successful trade businesses around the world they target to export every item they can find in order to gain a profit from the world the import export trade balance is healthy a 
and they are working to keep it at that high levels. This is a lesson we need to learn. It's not Sri Lanka's debt that has got us down. It's our failure to create a market that's w that would push our products to the world, hence milk in the dollars we require to strengthen our economy. If you and I want to turn this around, we have to stop thinking like beggars. We have to stop thinking like a nation um, who, ha who only su uh, survives through handouts. We have to stop thinking like the politicians who got us to this point. There are many avenues we can think of, but we are still stuck in this mentality that we need the IMF. And without the IMF, we are doomed. The day that you and I realized that Sri Lanka could make it without organizations like the IMF, for sure, after all, an organization that failed for 16 times will not get it the 17th time, right? That's logic. Perhaps that might be the lesson we need to learn after 75 years of our own governance. We'll be right back. Welcome back everyone. These days, uh, amidst the economic conversations, the biggest worry the people have is what's going to happen to electricity prices? Is it going to go up again? Can we afford it? You switch on the television hoping to learn something new. Well, you get this new drama being screened on everyday news. Janaka Ratna Kakina Pudgalia, Pahuke Kale Pura, but a Masidukala Tine, Ohuge, Paut Galika Mata Misa, Commissame Matano and Kinekatamai, Apida Budrati, Suadina Commission Sabah Dene, Despana, Adikari, Tirna, Kriatman, Nangu, and Neve, Evaki Suadina Vadagrima, Cabinet Mandale Veta, Evana Lada Lipia, Commission Sababa, Babata Hangavamin, Sababa Tura Yaupeka, Niti Virodi Saha, Mahajan Upika, Commissame, Tiena, Panata, Ulangani Kirima Kineka, Samajik and Dandalati, Aneko Samajik and Desha. Well, there are two sides uh, to this story. From the government side of things, the Minister of Power and Energy, Kanchan Vijay Sekar, says that the reason for this tariff hike is mainly because uh, they need to find the money to pay for thermal power generation. And currently, the CEB is deprived of borrowing money as banks are stating that their debt is unsustainable. Hence, they need to showcase to the banks that there is a proper income source that would bridge the loss. That's why the government is asking for the tariff hike. Uh, if you take the month of October in any year, month of October or November in any year, is it's when the CEB operates at an operating profit. But if you take 2022, these are actual figures, uh, 2022, January to up to September, up to October, we made losses. January, 8,408 billion loss, February, 10 billion loss, March, 14 billion, April, 14 billion, May, 9 billion, June, 14 billion, July, 28 billion, August, 9 billion, uh, September, 7 billion, October, we've made a profit of 2.8 billion, but again, November, 4.3 billion loss, and December, 28 billion loss. So the loss for 2022 is close to about 150 billion rupees. But the PUCSL has a different take on this. They say that the tariff hike is not necessary at the moment because the money is already there. As we think at the commission at this moment, we don't think that we need any tariff revision because with the given tariff revision in August, CB is making operational profits. It feels like this, isn't it? Back and forth is how we go. From 6 to 12 and back again. Back and forth to stay within. Now repeat after me. Back and forth. Back and forth. <laughs> 6 to 12. Kanchana says this, then Janaka says that, Kanchana says this again, Janaka says that again. 
Round and round goes the idiot wheel while you and I get frustrated by the minute. Well, our cameras once again roamed around the streets of Colombo and this is what some of you had to say. At the moment, the CEB, they're all non-performing entities. If they can open up a platform where solar power is allowed, general public can do it and they start purchasing as a private organization, that would sort out most of the problems here. I feel personally that the problems inside the government and the fighting between the CEB is stopping them from opening out the regulations so that people can start investing. You, know, you can start buying solar, subsidized rates. You see every other country doing it other than Sri Lanka. So hopefully that will change. Uh, as an ordinary person, what I feel is increasing power. I mean, the price is not necessary. Yeah, advanced level examinations is going on and they are just cutting the current and they are not even kind enough to provide the needed electricity that they want. And um, and of course the educated people are not ready to get into politics be, uh, because they know it's a nasty place. They know what's going on, they know what we are feeling but still they are not taking any steps and uh, I don't think so it's going to change. In a, even the car and bills is going to be like doubled, now it's like too much increase, right? Yeah, so it's terrible. I think, I don't think it's like better to live in this country anymore. It is affecting so much for the peop uh, for the children who are getting education right now, uh, for the O levels, A levels and all. If the government can assist people to get um, solar power, I think that will help both parties. Well, those were your views and uh, we all can understand the frustration. These two agencies really need to get their act together. Now, in order to understand uh, f further on this tariff hike, uh, let's go to Danidu Itanamasam, standing by Abhi Dinwood. Uh, Danidu, good to see you once again. Um, welcome uh, to uh, the program. Uh, I think we did, uh, I think it's about two weeks back, we did a similar segment uh, trying to understand how the new tariff uh, hike proposed by the uh, Ceylon Electricity Board and the Minister of Power and Energy when it comes to come into effect or if it comes into effect, uh, what would happen and who may have to pay what amount of money. Uh, now I also understand that you've been uh, thinking, uh, looking into this proposal and try to figure out uh, what are the hidden agendas of this proposal or are there any hidden ones or, or you know, there is a lot of narratives. Uh, the truth never comes out. It always comes out once it has been implemented, then people try to figure out, oh my God, we've been duped once again, or something of that nature. So what exactly uh, have you learned uh, um, when you look into these proposals uh, on the new tariff hike? Yes, Mahesh, this is, a, I think, a very interesting question that a lot of people are being affected by. Just to give a quick recap of what we did a few weeks back, it was, we focused on the majority of people using the, the amount of kilowatt hours that have been used, the number of units, basically, being used by a majority of people. That was about 1.5 million people that we focused on. That was between 0 and 30 kilowatt hours. And we focused on the price and the amount that they will have to pay the increase in tariffs. What I'm going to do today is just to focus on something that the minister was mentioning within the Gatriel program actually, where the minister tried to explain the amount of people that are actually paying a higher amount to the rate. And to do that, we really need to focus on where these numbers are, who are these people and where these numbers are. To give a proper breakdown of that, Mahesh, what I'll do is I'll take you through the numbers that are attached to the Ceylon Electricity Board, the number of households, basically known as customers in this instance, and I'll give you a breakdown of where these areas actually exist. Now, the majority, 6 billion, which is, which is what the minister focused on also, uh, is within the domestic sector, which is the daily usage, which is where what we see around the country. We see five other sections where there are subsidies that have been given, where are different rates for the number of kilowatt hours that have been used. We see religious institutions in that sector, that is about over 43,000. We, we see industrial sector, that is about over 60, 68,000. We see general, the general category include things like banks, things like hospitals, warehouses, and so on, uh, which includes over 800,000. Government facilities, for government institutions, which is over 9,000, and hotels, which is over 559. Now, the key thing I want to explain within this segment, Mahesh, is if we take within the domestic section, for the pr present amount of tariffs. Now, this is the argument that the minister was making, that there, were, there is, uh, he, the number he mentioned was over 300,000, but the number that we see is just over 200,000. There are a number of people, just over 200,000, paying 75 rupees per kilowatt hour. Now, this is the highest that is paid amongst all the categories, amongst all the categories that I was, being, uh, I was explaining. So, who are the people that are paying 75 per unit? 
that is the number of people that uh, the 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 individuals that fall the above 181 kilowatt hours now you see a number 250 here which is basically to say it has been broken down into four sections the 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 price will be determined based the the maximum price will be determined on people uh, spending for 250 for 500 for 750 and for 100 kilowatt hours now that is how the uh, breakdown is done the energy charge is 75 as i mentioned now this is the highest that is being paid as of now and the monthly charge with there's a fixed monthly charge of 1500 the proposed amount is for, to give 2000 now as the minister focuses on this he mentions that we should not have one section of people having 75 rupees that is being given per kilowatt hour and the argument he makes after that is mentioning now this mahesh as you can clearly see is not the low income level this is the high income level these are the people that use a lot of electricity basically so the argument he made was now they will move into a rooftop so, uh, rooftop solar now that is the kind of sustainable energy that that movement will happen and then he went on to say that the ceb will lose those customers now you and i can have a debate about this whether that's a good or a bad thing it, it but looks like as if you know if they are moving into solar energy and if they are the highest uh, number of uh, um, you know consumers who pay that highest rate are moving into uh, solar energy because of this power tariff hike uh, uh, is not exactly a bad thing if we look uh, at the country's energy dependency exactly now i mean i mean that's exactly the point uh, and i think that is the sort of argument that you were also bringing out within that program because we are not sure about why there is a lackluster approach there because we have seen this with the solar electricity board mind you we have seen this for a long period of time but we have question about where the minister lies on this so what we see is that if there is a push made through the tariffs to move into solar energy i think that is very much a good thing but we uh, have we can't be myopic in that scenario mahesh and mention okay we'll just have these 200000 customers move into solar we need a more a bigger transition basically so to, in order to do that what exactly is the tariff structure is a question that has to be posed yeah then uh, i understood uh, i mean uh, solar energy renewable energy is the way forward for a country like sri lanka because we've seen like last year what happened uh even right now we can't uh, basically uh be depending on oil in order to uh keep our power structures running we really need to move into something that is sustainable and that, i mean solar yes it is expensive at this moment this is where the government has to be talking about and actually taking steps to make sure that people have these types of facilities to take in uh you know buy uh, solar units I think it's very expensive at this moment but uh, that is where the government should be thinking because sustainable energy is something that a country like Sri Lanka can uh, have and on top of it have the energy dependency. Uh Danidu Tanwasam thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate Danidu Tanwasam and the data board. Let's uh, talk about solutions for this crisis and for that joining me now is the former chairman of the Strategic Enterprise Management Agency Ashoka Begunwardena. Uh, sir, appreciate your time. Uh, thank you very much um, for speaking to us. Now, the minister just like uh, we just showed earlier on proposes a 60% hike in the beginning of this year. But the PUCSL chairman says can't do it. What is the middle ground? Because we need to pay what it costs. That is understandable, but we can't pay the cost for the losses made about 10 15 years ago so what is the middle ground that is fair for both parties the answer is simple uh, mahesh now uh, there are three parties involved the government that's the ministry the service provider that's the silon electricity board and the regulator that's the uh, public utilities commission so if if each and every party uh, look into concentrate on its role and responsibilities then we can find a solution now what's happening is uh, we are discussing about the consumer tariff uh, which should be cost reflective meaning that the ceb should not uh, uh, running at a loss so that's true so uh, from the point of view of the consumers the government should make sure that the uh, as you mentioned the costs are uh, reasonable and the from whom we should uh, charge that should be transparent so to up, up to that extent the C, the government will be setting the policies and the service provider puc uh, the silon electricity board uh, should ensure that they are um, generating the uh, required power at the lowest cost and selling at a fair price and the regulator's role is to ensure that the ceb uh, the process at the ceb is transparent and it's it's with the within line within the line 
of the government policy. So that's the uh, uh, purpose. Now, what's happening right now is the uh, if if uh, we can understand that the ministry is going beyond their territory and trying to intervene and introduce tariff. It's not the uh, uh, ministry's role. It's the role of the regulator in consultation with the public, uh, the uh, Ceylon Electricity Board. So to that extent, uh, now the solution is there. We need to recheck the uh, submissions made by the CEB and the response of the Public Utilities Commission. And to be transparent, it, it should be uh, uh, it should be make uh, uh, aware that the public is know about uh, no, uh, public know about that, and uh, the solution, ultimate solution, will give the answer to the, all these questions. Understood. Uh, well, uh, the Minister of Power and Energy, Kanchan Vijay Sekar, was, uh, was on one of my other programs recently, and uh, he said that out of the 6 million users, about over uh, 300,000 uh, households are the ones who uh, bears the highest amount of cost for a unit. We just um, did a, a segment on that as well. Now, uh, the rest get subsidized rates uh, due to the categories that they are in, be it industrial, religious, or other. Is this a sustainable way of proceeding? Because only a few pay high and a majority pay a very low price. Well, uh, to understand the, the real situation, we need to understand how the consumers consume. Now, if all this, uh, all this uh, uh, power generated is at the same cost, then the average is the fair uh, benchmark we can say that above that is uh, paying more and below that is paying less. But the real situation is uh, now 95% of the consumers consume less amount of energy. Whereas the 5% you mentioned and it's about 50% of the total consumption in the domestic sector is consumed by only by 20% of the uh, customers. So uh, when you look back now, the, from the point of view of power generation, the cost is not the same. Uh, we start with hydro, which is two, two rupees 80 cents a unit. Uh, then we go to the coal, which is 48 rupees per unit. And when you go to the uh, oil fired power generation, it's 88 rupees. So uh, to cater to the demand, what CEB is doing is first, they try to uh, provide, cater to the requirement with hydro, then if, if it's not adequate, then with coal and then go to uh, expensive power plants of oil-fired power plant. So the average cost increases because of this high-end consumers. They consume more because of that reason we have to generate more energy. Because of that reason uh, we have to go for oil-fired power plants. So average does not reflect the true, true condition. So 80%, I must say 80% of the consumers paying more for, to cater to the demand of the balanced 20%. So exactly the opposite of what Minister has said. Minister is saying that uh, uh, they are subsidized in the poor or the uh, low-end consumers, whereas the actual situation is low-end consumers are subsidized in the high-end consumers. They are paying less because of the marginalized cost is higher for, to cater to their increasing demand. Absolutely. Um, well. What are the alternative solutions we can actually look into for this current issue? Uh, the actual situation in a crisis like this in the power sector, the first thing we have to concentrate is how to conserve energy. Use, uh, use efficiently and uh, reduce the consumption as much as possible. So that practice was there right throughout the his, uh, history. But nowadays, we cannot see that the present government is encouraging the people to uh, uh, consume less, uh, conserve, so that we can meet, we can cater to this crisis situation. So that's number one, which is not happening. So the second point is, if they are not doing that, then we need to go for power cuts. That will lead to another uh, issue because of that will be that will have a huge impact on the economy. So. Uh, the, the third one is the tariff. The tariff issue, we have to make sure that we shouldn't compromise the basic needs of the people. We need to concentrate on the high end, those who are consuming more, for them to go for other alternatives or uh, to, uh, to give up their luxury requirement and 
uh, go through this uh, crisis period. So for, for that purpose, what they have to do is we have to charge from the high end, which is happening is the exactly opposite. Now, when we compare the prices in July, the proposed one will increase the price of the low end consumers by 12 times, 12 times. Whereas the high end consumers, it's only doubled. So what exactly we have to do, it's exactly the opposite. What we can do is, well, we can, uh, we can increase the uh, tariff of the high end consumers by four, four times, then we can uh, bridge this gap of uh, uh, consumption and uh, the generation cost and the uh, revenue. So in order to bridge this gap, you shouldn't touch the low end consumers who are utilizing energy for their basic needs and you should charge from the high end consumers. You can, uh, you can increase their uh, uh, tariff by four times you can get the same result. Indeed. Um, thank you very much. We had to leave it at that. Uh, that was the former chairman of the Strategic Enterprise Management Agency, Ashok Abegundra. Abegundra, apologies, uh, speaking to us. Let's take a short commercial break. This is State of the Nation, back in a moment. Welcome back everyone, this is the State of the Nation. Guess who came to dinner? Yep, none other than Mama Newland. Let's talk a bit about the US Under Secretary of uh, State for Political Affairs, Victoria Newland's visit to Sri Lanka. Now, if you were oblivious to her visit and her influence in Sri Lankan matters, oh, uh, you must be part of the Colombo liberal menace. If you are not, then you clearly need to wake up because you are ignoring one of the key puppet masters who has extended her strings of influence to some of the most important authorities within our country. And I can hear how hard the radical Colombo liberals are on Twitter screaming conspiracy because that's their go-to line to shut down their rivals. After all, they are weak-minded people who don't have the willpower to listen to reasoning. My intention is not to spread conspiracy, but to spread awareness of something happening right under our noses. And I, for one, am tired of getting played by these superpowers. Victoria Jane Newland rose to fame with tw in 2014 with leaked phone conversations. Actually, why did I play this video package so you understand what I'm talking about? When you're a high-ranking official talking about diplomatic efforts in Ukraine, the last thing you want to do is drop your guard. So that would be great, I think, to help glue this thing and have the UN help glue it and, you know, f*** the EU. But that is exactly what reportedly happened between US Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Newland and US Ambassador to Ukraine Jeffrey Pyatt. The exchange has since surfaced online, including the crude swipe at the European Union. The audio clip of a woman and man, said to be Newland and Pyatt, hears them discussing strategies to work with the three main opposition figures. There is a suggestion for Newland to contact Klitschko directly to play to his top dog sensibilities, while Newland refers to getting the United Nations involved in a political solution. And that's where the unfortunate comment arises. I'm obviously not going to comment on private diplomatic conversations. Uh, other than to say uh, it was pretty impressive tradecraft. The audio was uh, extremely clear. Hello, how are you? Good to see you. We're here from America. Would you like some bread? Please take something. Thank you for coming here. This was Newland and Pyatt visiting Independence Square in Kiev in December, handing out food to protesters and police. This latest episode is embarrassing for the US and allows Russia to argue that the opposition is being manipulated by Washington, something that Barack Obama has always denied. 
Well, basically what she did in Ukraine was to push people there to topple the pro-Russian government led by Viktor Yanukovych and install a puppet of their own through radical people's protests. Sounds familiar to us Sri Lankans, isn't it? I mean, I understand most of you have short-term memory loss. Just think about the similarities between the regime change in Ukraine back in 2014 and how the US played the people there and put that nation into war. They did the same thing here to us as well. She is now here to lecture us about reconciliation, while her president, Joe Biden, is a walking carcass, spreading racial hatred, lies and misinformation in the US and destroying small businesses. She's also here to remind us about reforming the PTA, Prevention of Terrorism Act, while her government is upholding the same thing, calling it the Patriotic Act. Perhaps we should too change the name of our Prevention of Terrorism Act to Patriotic Act, and then the US will be so happy with us. She's also here to advise us to hold elections in March and be inspired by climate activists in Sri Lanka. I have to give it to the Americans sometimes. They know the game. They know how to play. Actually, they invented this game. And you and I have no way of winning because they've rigged it so much to benefit them. But here is something I was most intrigued by in her speech. Last summer, the Sri Lankan people made clear their desire for a cleaner, more accountable government and a more prosperous and inclusive democracy here. The US is proud to be Sri Lanka's partner as you do the hard work, and we know it is hard work, to secure the future that all Sri Lankans deserve. Sri Lankan people? Did she actually interpret the Aragalia on our behalf? Can someone remind her that the Aragalia was not an election that took place and it's not, not even a people's mandate, but an unlawful push by a selective few whom she funded, allegedly, and created chaos in this country so that we can be a beggar's nation once again at the behest of the IMF. Let's zoom out a bit. Why is Mrs. F the EU, better known as Mama Newland, is here in the first place? This is where you and I will have to work together to join a few dots. Now, India's alliance with Russia for oil is probably one of the most important geopolitical decisions in the past few years. In the Ukraine conflict, Mama Nuland's most important project was getting all their teammates to stand in line against Russia and China. They needed India. India made a call to be on the side of their people and purchase oil from Russia despite the outcry from the US. With India no longer being a good boy with the US on Ukraine or Russia for that matter, we recently saw a scathing smear campaign against India mushrooming in the West. Firstly, it was done by the BBC, also known as the Best British Comedy Channel, released a documentary on Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi trying to showcase that he was instrumental in ethnic cleansing in 2002 Gujarati riots. No sooner that went on, an unknown research firm from the US released a report on India's wealthiest company Adani, crashing its stocks and wiping off more than $100 billion. Now, before arriving in Sri Lanka, Mama Nuland visited India. Well, for what? Did she go there to tell India to get in line as well? That same India is looking at Sri Lanka for growth and partnership. I believe it's clear to anyone looking at this why the US would want to know where Sri Lanka stands when their biggest Asian partner has now made a historic switch. Like I said many times in previous episodes, you control energy, you control the nation. So is the US here to tell us to refrain from taking support from India on our energy needs and to streamline ourselves with the US. Perhaps Mama Nuland might have given Basil Rajapaksa, another US energy company, to come into Sri Lanka. These are not isolated incidents. There are other things we need to be aware of. Think about the most recent uh, naval exercise between the US and Sri Lankan militaries. It was just last week. What was the purpose of that? Are they trying to build up a military post here? 
Perhaps because Diego Garcia is way too far for the Americans. These were the same people that threw a fit when the Chinese ship Yuang Wan 5 docked at the Hambantara port. You Google the ship's name today and the first search result from the most incredible and unbiased news source in the world, the BBC, touts it as a spy ship. Yes, the BBC, whom the Colombo Twitter liberals believe so bluntly. Now, here's a fun story. The BBC's fact-checking service wrote a piece during the Aragalia saying that the protesters did not take over the Rupa Vahini Corporation when it clearly did. There were protesters in the Rupa Vahini Corporation. There was a court case against that person who did. You remember he was even uh, uh, taken out from a plane when he was trying to slowly slip away. Yes, and this, the best joke is this article still exists in the BBC saying fact check. Just imagine, this is the BBC, supposed to be the gold standard of journalism. Now the gold standard of British comedy. Anyhow, uh, about Mama Newland, we need to be prudent to understand the devil in disguise if America really wants to help Sri Lanka. They can easily tell the IMF to kindly provide assistance since they have the controlling stake in the IMF. But instead, they are once again using it to change our laws and policies and now pushing the 13th Amendment back into the discussion to create more chaos and unrest in Sri Lanka. All right, uh, joining me now is political analyst Malinda Senivratna. Thank you for your time, Malinda. Good to see you once again. Um, last time Victoria Nuland was here, we saw massive protests taking place soon afterwards. Lots of conversations occurred in various corners of our society saying uh, that she was here to get the former president in line with America's policies and not to go towards China. Well, Malinda, this time also we see she is back because the current president is not so much anti-Chinese uh, to the Americans. What do you think is the purpose of a visit this time around? She said the, the most inspiring meeting uh, she had was with some climate activist. Are we to believe that? Uh, well, Mahesh, uh, first of all, uh, no American diplomat or, or representative roams the world uh, just to have parties. They are there, they do their work to serve American interests, not Sri Lanka's interests. What she did in her last visit is of course now all history, but this visit comes at a time when uh, uh, the Adani group is under tremendous attack. Now the India is essentially seeking a monopoly of our energy sector through the Adani group. So it is no coincidence that uh, Newland is coming here because obviously she would prefer uh, an American monopoly of the energy sector as opposed to India in a, at a time when India is not towing the US line, especially with regard to Ukraine. And the world essentially is not really taking um, too much notice of what Washington has to say. So Newland probably has those things uh, in her mind. And if it's uh, climate change that she is worried about, uh, she's excited about, if that is her concern, well, the US, USA has been the has been the biggest roadblock to any positive global action on uh, climate related uh, issues. So that's funny. I mean, I mean, you can make what you want of, of it, but this visit comes at a time when Ranil Vikram Singh, as you mentioned, he is not, is not as anti-China as the US may want, to, want him to be. But there has also been a change in how he has been looking at uh, Sri Lanka and Sri Lankan interests now with the 13th Amendment, the statements he has made, uh, which uh, is creating, is generating a lot of uh, anger and uh, anxiety among all kinds of we never had uh, uh, elections for provincial council in five years now no one wanted it right so newland uh, newland's visit we have to see as an interfere as a just another visit of an interfering uh, and uh, of, a, of an interfering u.s diplomat whose interests don't coincide with us. Absolutely. Um, Malinda, uh, we see many anti-Indian sentiments building up in the West right now. Has India's relationship with the USA changed? 
Well, uh, India didn't, as I mentioned, India's uh, issue uh, position with regard to Ukraine. India didn't uh, support NATO. India didn't support Russia. India took a neutral stand, and that is not enough, I, I suppose, for the West and for NATO. And uh, this is probably why we are seeing uh, a lot of attacks on India, especially Prime Minister Modi. And the Adani group is, of course, something else. But uh, the recent uh, documentary, BBC documentary on uh, on uh, Modi, that is not a very friendly documentary. We know how mischievous the BBC is, Channel 4, and what they, talk, they did with uh, Sri Lanka. So uh, it's, it's a global political economy issue. And uh, uh, maybe a fear on the part of Washington about a shift in the center of gravity in uh, global affairs. True, true. Uh, but I understand what you're trying to uh, say now. Now, Malinda, uh, I want to talk about something else with regard to foreign policy. What changes do you think we should make uh, regarding our foreign policy? Seems like that we are being treated like a football in the global stage. Well, we have put ourselves in a position to be treated like a football, uh, not just uh, few, over the last few months, but uh, several decades. Uh, we remember that Nixon's uh, visit to Sri Lanka was essentially to persuade Sri Lanka not to go with the rubberized pact with uh, China. So from that time onwards, they have had this problem about uh, you know, where Sri, Sri Lanka should stand. The non-land movement is no longer in operation for all intents and purposes. And uh, so when we talk about who our friends are, the West is in decline. China and Japan owe the, uh, the, the debt of Europe and North America. What are you talking about? These guys are not, not exactly rolling in money, they are rolling in debt. Uh, we need to know what, what our interests are in the first place. If you don't know what our interests are, then, then what the hell can we do about uh, you know, how, how, we op how we treat uh, or, or uh, have relations with any other uh, country? So that's the question I think we should uh, try to resolve in the first place. Who are we? What do we want? Where have we come from? Where do we want to go? Those questions are not being asked or addressed by uh, governments, opposition. None of the political parties are actually talking about those things. Indeed, indeed. There's a lot more to talk about this. Thank you very much. Uh, that was political analyst Malinda Seniviratnam. We have to leave it at that. We are going to take a short commercial break. This is the State of the Nation. Back in a moment. Sri Lanka might not have deserved this predicament, an economic crisis, a swarm of vultures looking to pick us apart, an internal political strife. But contemplating on that will get us nowhere. Instead, we need to power through this crisis and fight for a unified country for which so many gave their lives. It is not enough to say we live in paradise if we are not taking the burden and responsibility of protecting that paradise. Victoria Nuland is not to be blamed. I agree with my colleague Malinda when he says they are working for American interests. But my frustration, and I'm sure yours as well, comes up when we ask the basic question. Why don't we have diplomats working as hard as Victoria Nuland or perhaps Julie Chung to expand our interests overseas? Why don't we have Sri Lankans working for Sri Lanka's interests? In my career in the media, I have had the privilege of sitting in front of many foreign dignitaries and foreign service representatives. It has always been my position that we need to pull up our socks in that department. We, on the show continuously, have had to present uh, instances in different countries where we lack a consolidated national effort to push the truth. This is most evident in Canada where the LTTE propaganda brainwashing machine is hard at work. I don't mean to uh, sound like a broken record or be the instigator of panic, but if we do nothing, generations of Canadians will be born with a wrong and deeply manipulated view of Sri Lanka. What makes you think this will, that will stop there? Thinking about this country, I almost 
all this end up with a heavy heart because I care about this place. I know most of you who are tuning in care deeply as well. But this emotion, unfortunately, hasn't translated into operation. It hasn't moved mountains as it should. And we are running out of time. At least, I hope, our pain will teach us how to move for this nation. As Aristotle said, we cannot learn without pain. On a programming note, make sure you listen to our podcast release weekly. The State of the Nation podcast available on Apple Podcast and Spotify. I'm Mahesh Johnny from all of us at Adhidharana24. Have a good night and a productive week. I'll see you back again next Sunday.